Well, welcome to our program. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, located in Glen Cove, New York. We have what I think is a very interesting program this morning with HMTC's scholar in residence, Dr. Linda Burkhardt, who is going to speak about Washington Heights, the neighborhood in Upper Manhattan that became a particular haven for German speaking Jews fleeing from Nazi Germany. Before I introduce our speaker, however, I will put in a plug for some of our other upcoming programs. Next Tuesday on January 11th, we're holding our next program in our 2G Tuesday series, where children of Holocaust survivors present the testimony of their parent or parents. In this program on the 11th, Debbie Cohn is going to be talking about her mother, Ilsa Loeb, who grew up in Vienna, but in the wake of Kristallnacht was sent by her family to, for safety to the Netherlands. Uh, Ilsa was later forced into hiding and survived the war, but she never saw her parents again. So I hope you'll join us to hear Debbie tell that story. Um, I will be back for my next Curator's Corner, my short programs about particular objects and images in our collection on Wednesday, January 12th, when I'll be talking about two photographs in our galleries that were taken shortly after the liberation of Auschwitz. As you may know, later this month on January 27, we mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So I thought it would be appropriate to discuss what we show in our galleries of that liberation and share some of that larger context. And one more program to mention, on Sunday, January 16th at 12.30 in the afternoon, we'll be hosting a virtual program with author and historian Amy Butler Greenfield, who will be talking about her recent book, The Woman All Spies Fear, and the accomplishments of one of America's great code breakers during World War I and World War II, Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Um, she, we're also, I should add, we are going to be showing a film about Elizabeth Miss Smith Friedman in March during Women's History Month. And so I hope that this book presentation will give us all some additional background for that program. You can find details about these and all our programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org and then click on the events tab. I also hope you will go to our website and click the Give Now button to support programs like today's talk. Before COVID, we held programs like today's presentation by Dr. Burghardt um, in person, and we charged an admission fee. With the virtual platform, we have chosen not to impose a paywall, but the expenses and costs for the operation of HMTC have not changed. We rely on donations, and so I again urge you to go to our website, www.hmtcli.org, and click the Give Now button. Okay, enough advertisement. Let me get to today's program. And for that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and ask our speaker, Dr. Linda Burkhardt to come on. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Burkhardt, our scholar in residence and somebody I count on as a friend. Uh, Dr. Burkhardt worked as a freelance reporter for the New York Times for 20 years and is the author of three nonfiction books. She also holds a PhD from LIU Post and is the daughter of Holocaust survivors from Vienna. She has presented a number of powerful and informative presentations with us over the years. And today she will be talking about a haven from the Holocaust, Washington Heights and the Jews of Europe. I'm very grateful for Linda's work with HMTC and I'm delighted to welcome her to our virtual stage. Linda. Great, thank you so much, Thorin. Thank you. I'll just share my screen now and then we can get started. So let me do this. Bunch of clicks and then we get going. Okay, great. So uh, welcome everyone. And I'm very glad to be here today to talk to you about the New York City neighborhood of Washington Heights. This was a place of refuge for the Jews fleeing Hitler and a haven for the survivors who came afterward. Now, what exactly did Washington Heights offer the Jews who escaped Nazi occupied Europe how did the neighborhood around the famous George Washington Bridge, which we see here, help them heal and provide them with a community in which to bond and create themselves anew, a place where they could belong? This is a significant story. It's a story about an ending in Europe and a beginning in America. 
Now for every Jewish family that arrived in New York from Hitler's Europe, the decision about where to live was paramount. The refugees had lost nearly everything. It's hard to imagine money, status, position, family, their language, their sense of their place in society. And most would be worried about their survival for a very long time. Being safe and accepted were top priorities. But given that many of them wanted to settle in New York City because they knew there would be many other Jews there, how did they know which neighborhood to choose? New York, as we know, is a big, complicated, and very exciting, but difficult to understand place when you first arrive. So where were the schools good and the prejudice against them likely to be low? Where could they learn how to become Americans? Where would they become acculturated? Where exactly were the other Jews who had come before them? People who were survivors from the pogroms and refugees from the ravages of war. Where are they? Now, of all these questions, perhaps the last was the one that embodied all of the others. The neighborhoods where the other Jews had already settled would have all the qualities that the refugees and the survivors were searching for. And what were these? They were affordable rents, low or non-existent anti-Semitism, neighbors who might become friends, safety, a place to belong, and top-notch public schools. That was always an issue, the schools. Some refugees were lucky. They had recently settled relatives who could guide them or better yet, invite them into their homes for the time it took them to get acclimated and find their own place. Others who were entirely on their own depended on word of mouth and something very important, newspaper ads. Now, many of them were published in the German press, um, especially the Aufbau, and I'll talk about that a little more later. And also um, the mainstream press, which if the immigrants knew English or enough English, they could understand, and also the Yiddish papers like the Forward. So in all of these cases, a broad majority of the arriving refugees were led to Washington Heights. This was a lively, hilly, neighborhood in Upper Manhattan with soaring views of the Palisades cliffs across the Hudson. So there was a lot of beauty there in addition to everything else. The Palisades cliffs in New Jersey um, added a special dimension to, um, to the beauty of the area. They were family-sized apartments. There were broad streets um, and tree-lined avenues like Cabrini Boulevard and Fort Washington Avenue, Pinehurst Avenue. And these were beacons for the European immigrants. It was an added plus that the A train was there. And um, it, the A train, um, the subway system was something that the people learned to navigate pretty quickly. It, uh, it ran to Midtown where there was work for some and training for others. There were small shops lining the major shopping streets selling everything you could imagine that the Europeans would want particularly to eat. Salami, sausages, pastries. Bakeries sold streusel, Flaumenkuchen, Seamstresses spoke German and the other languages of Europe's um, earlier emigres, and they knew both the styles in New York and Paris and Vienna and Berlin, of course. And the parks, with their winding paved pathways, opened onto rolling lawns that brought back memories of leisurely strolls that the emigres had taken in Vienna and Berlin's redundant LA's. Now in the hills of Northern Manhattan, Washington Heights became home to 25,000 European Jews in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. People who had come to the US who were hoping to replace their dark nightmares with bright dreams of the future. This became the largest community of German Jews in the world in the post-war years, in the world. All of them there to make new lives for themselves and to raise strong first-generation children for whom they had many plans and a great deal of hope and they did find success. They would find jobs, create new careers, make friends, raise families, and find people, some people, to replace the dozens of family members, the parents, children, husbands, wives, siblings, whom they had lost. Some of the residents, when they achieved a certain level of success, economic success mostly, would move away to more opulent surroundings. They would go downtown to the Upper West Side or out to new developments in Queens, which were popping up, um, or even make the enormous leap to the suburbs in Westchester, New Jersey, or Long Island. But for the first 10, 20, or 30 critical years, these people, these refugees, these displaced, disoriented, disgraced, and often even devastated newcomers, <clears throat> the refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe, 
lived in and were embraced by the hilly, rocky, diverse Washington Heights. And while they did the all important work of learning to navigate the subway, figure out the school system, understand the foreign sounding accents of the grocer and the butcher, the community would somehow magically transfer its vitality and its energy into the courage and the resilience that the newly arrived needed to assimilate into the new land and to become Americans. Washington Heights is located on a plateau atop a high bluff above the Hudson River to the west and the deep Broadway Valley to the east. It comprises a large part of the narrow tip of Northern Manhattan Island. You can see here <clears throat> Manhattan in green, the skinny green part at the top of the Manhattan map is where Washington Heights is with Inwood above it and Harlem below. So the community was named for Fort Washington this was a fortification constructed in 1775 by the Continental Army, and it was constructed to defend the military from the British forces during the American Revolution. There are reenactments every number of years, and um, here is one of them. They're very popular. It was built at the highest natural point on Manhattan Island, at the elevation, at an elevation that's almost as high as the top of the torch of the Empire State Building. Manhattan is hilly, Washington Heights is particularly hilly. So there are many interesting changes of elevation. And the community is bordered by Dykeman Street and Inwood to the north. And this is also a lively community that was home at the time to many German Jews and even with its own very famous Konditorei, Nash, which was very popular and uh, frequented uh, quite, quite often by the refugees and the other people living in Inwood, a lovely community. Harlem forms the south border along 155th Street, and um, the, on the eastern side is the Harlem River. The terrain, the terrain is hilly, so pedestrian navigation is facilitated uh, by the urban planners who put the neighborhood together and kept um, adding to it um, by so-called step, step streets, such as the one on Pinehurst Avenue, which give the neighborhood a certain charm. Again, it's because of the hills. And it's also for one of the reasons that many of the kids who grew up in Washington Heights never learned to ride bikes because there were too many hills. There was just no really good flat area where it was safe, particularly being children of European immigrants who were very careful of the safety of their children. Now, the longest set of step stairs is 130 stairs connecting Fort Washington Avenue and Overlook Terrace at 187th Street, set along a high rocky ridge. The more prestigious part of Washington Heights with the best housing lies in the north and the west, basically comprising the area between 173rd Street and Fort Tryon Park at 192nd Street. We'll talk more about Fort Tryon Park. Um, and hugging the Hudson River along um, the east flank. And this pocket of the neighborhood has today been nicknamed Hudson Heights, sometimes called um, Fort George. Uh, it's the real estate people who are coming up with new names uh, for, for these, this particular area in Washington Heights. And this is the area where most of the European Jews chose to live. So during its early beginnings in the, in the late 1800s, Washington Heights was very sparsely populated by luxurious mansions and single family homes. The neighborhood developed uh, slowly into a middle-class community when many Irish and Eastern Europeans um, settled there, the first immigrants who, who came over. And during World War I, uh, refugees from Hungary and Poland moved in next to the Irish and the older English residents, and some Greek and Armenian inhabitants made their homes there in, as well. The neighborhood developed rapidly during the early 1900s as Upper Manhattan became connected to the Manhattan, uh, to the rest of Manhattan via the construction of the subways. This was the famous A train, A train of song, the C train and the number one subway line. The new ease of transportation brought about an ambitious building campaign throughout the 1920s and the early 1930s. This is significant because pretty soon those apartments would be needed. Five and six story apartment buildings with modern elevators, and this was uh, a new development that these buildings would actually have elevators. They were built on vacant lots, mostly west of Broadway, and that's the, um, the newer, part of Washington, newer part of Washington Heights. Um, and with a great deal of parkland um, interspersed overlooking the Hudson River. So it was a beautiful area. 
uh, the then fashionable Art Deco style was prominent along with some Tudor revival. And these stylish new apartment houses offered large rooms, tall windows, wide courtyards, and um, these amenities differentiated them from the lower, the older lower rent walk-ups that were further east, basically on the east side of Broadway. Broadway runs all the way up and down Manhattan, as I'm sure um, most of you know, and it is a dividing line in many neighborhoods. And in some ways it was in Washington Heights too. But then, then came the depression and many of these beautiful new apartments remained vacant. At the same time, as we well know in Europe, Nazism was gaining catastrophic force in Germany and some 550,000 Jews living in Germany at the time began to emigrate, most of them arriving in New York and many staying there. In March of 1938, when Hitler annexed Austria in the Anschluss, suddenly Austria's 200,000 Jews became subject overnight to the same devastating laws that had been set in force in Germany under Hitler over the past five years. The Jews in Germany and Austria pushed to leave the country. Austria was now part of the German Reich and full emigration panic set in after Kristallnacht occurred all over Germany and Austria in November, 1938. 30,000 Jews were arrested on Kristallnacht and sent to concentration camps. Some were released if, the, if relatives had papers saying that they would immediately emigrate. Emigration started um, to grow increasingly difficult uh, at that time until it was entirely cut off in October, 1941. At that point, about 250,000 German and Austrian Jews were left behind. Of that group, 90% would perish. However, close to 175,000 refugees from Hitler had been able to come from Germany and Austria to America. And about one in seven members of this group eventually settled in Washington Heights. The newcomers made up a full 50% of the total population of Washington Heights, a very high proportion. And they gave the imprint, their imprint to the neighborhood. But even more significant, I think, the neighborhood gave its imprint to them. In the years after World War II, the neighborhood was sometimes referred to as Frankfurt on the Hudson due to the dense population of German and Austrian Jews who had settled there and the stores and services created there um, to serve them. Some people even referred to the community as the Fourth Reich, ironically. Now, one might wonder why so many of the German speaking Jews went specifically to Washington Heights when others settled in other lovely, beautiful and welcoming communities like Forest Hills and Kew Gardens and Queens and the Upper West Side. Well, one very attractive aspect of Washington Heights was the presence of many synagogues. These were formed by the European Jews who had emigrated before World War I, but an equally strong economic pull was its abundance of housing stock from the 20s and 30s from that construction boom. The large, new, relatively inexpensive, and most importantly, empty apartments overlooking the river were a major attraction to a group of people who had come to America with very little actual money because they were not allowed to take money out, but with middle-class tastes and sensibilities. And many of them had beautiful new clothes because you could have clothes made before you left the country and just wear several layers when you left. You weren't taking money, but you were taking something that had meaning to you. So how can we more deeply understand these German speaking immigrants, these strangers who arrived in what must have felt like a very strange land these people who had survived by fleeing from Hitler only to find that they still had to fight to survive in America. It was of course the height of the depression when most of them arrived. Scholars tell us that people immigrate for many reasons. They immigrate for better economic conditions because of poverty, exile, war, political issues. As we know, the Jews from Germany and Austria and other European Jews who followed later did not leave their homes in search of a better life as many of the other groups who came to Washington Heights later, long after the war, like the Cubans and the Dominicans. The German Jews left, of course, because they were forced out. Since the reasons the groups immigrate are always closely tied together with the level of economic prosperity, the education and the social class of the people themselves, Understanding these factors 
can provide the key to understanding the Jews who built the thriving society in Washington Heights and succeeded there. But exactly who were they? What did they believe? What did they value? Unlike most refugee groups, which immigrants in, in, in which immigrants tried to raise themselves out of poverty and make a better life for themselves and for their children, the German Jews were not poor, they were not unemployed. Most in fact were highly educated. They were deeply and broadly cultured. Most had professions, good jobs, social status, a place in society and owned homes and cars. In their old lives in Europe, they had possessed a strong sense of self, pride in their abilities and their accomplishments, a solid knowledge of their place in the world and a solid understanding of the world around them. Now all of this was shattered. And to make matters worse, they started out with two more strikes against them, strikes that would hinder them drastically in their search for success in their new homeland. And these were the anti-Semitism that still sadly existed in American society at large and their German names and language. But somehow, despite these drawbacks, they had to learn to navigate a new system, master a new language, forge new professions, make money, and perhaps most difficult of all, to try to save family members who had not yet been able to emigrate. Ultimately, they would have to accommodate those relatives if they succeeded and deal with their grief if they failed. Many of their traits set the German Jewish immigrants apart from the ordinary, the other types of refugees and immigrants who came. They were more often middle-class, older and better educated, and they often came with a complex mix of German and Jewish identities, which made their integration into the new country a little more complicated than usual. The German Jews had always valued elegance, for example, and strove to meet each day with not a hair out of place, not a smudge on the lapel, and with shoes always shined. They built a stable, loving neighborhood for their children after having undergone, undergone the terrors of persecution and exile and the trauma that went along with that. They found work, they sported the latest fashions, they set up networks to help each other, they established synagogues, and they set the goal of sending the next generation to college. Yet they were nonetheless treated with suspicion by society. At the time, there was still significant anti-Semitism in the US, even in New York City. And of course, there was the fact that we were at war with their home country. And the combination served to alienate the German and the Austrian Jewish immigrants from the rest of society, except in Washington Heights, where everyone understood. And this bound the group together into a community that offered support simply by providing the comforts, comforts of familiarity, cooking smells that everyone recognized, commonalities in dress and manners and goals, and of course, being able to speak German together, although quietly and mostly only in private. Though limited out of respect for their new status as residents in America, even though they were considered enemy aliens, a very difficult pill to swallow for many of them, still, they were, they were here. Um, on the streets and in the parks and in the hallways of apartment buildings, German and Viennese dialects were much more common than English. For many, strolling arm in arm down a leafy park lane or through city streets as couples, as they had done in Europe for generations, served as a comforting reminder of the old ways in the old country and a hint of hope that these could be recreated here with some success in this new land. But like every immigrant group that comes to America, the Jews who populated Washington Heights had to make a double adjustment to become Americans. Somehow they had to maintain their own original identity. And this issue set up a roadblock in their effort to become modernized, assimilated, and acculturated. Among the immigrants themselves, there was an ambivalent attitude toward things German. On the one hand, many continued to enjoy German literature and to read widely. They would praise German music, though not Wagner, and most of them continued to hold their native language in high esteem. Germans greeted other Germans on the street with a brisk Guten Tag, and the Viennese, the, Austri the Austrians greeted the um, other Austrians with the classic Servus. And they all especially liked to cook and eat German foods. Stores in Washington Heights that sold German products, such as Carl Amers and the Deitch Dairy, were very popular. 
Yet most of the German Jews in the neighborhood did not consider themselves primarily German or Austrian anymore. Their ties to Germany and Austria had been deeply discolored by the Holocaust and replaced with anger and sadness. Now the goal was to embrace the new life and to become an American, but how? An especially important vehicle for transmitting American culture to the recently arrived German speaking Jews was the German language newspaper called the Aufbau. Published in Washington Heights, this widely read weekly created specifically for the German Jewish immigrants to the US bonded the community together through their common trauma. It reported on what had happened to former friends and neighbors who were now scattered throughout the world. It offered news and political reporting. It created an intellectual forum for ideas and it gave the refugees a place to belong. In addition to articles by prominent writers and intellectuals like the controversial Hannah Arendt, Stefan Zweig and Albert Einstein, it contained ads for apartments, practicalities, news of social clubs, announcements of marriages, births, deaths, anniversaries, and articles about local shops and services. All of this useful and usable information helped anchor and support the German Jewish community and connected to, to connect them to the other Jews who had come over at the same time, but also to the Jews who had emigrated earlier. A very important connection. Significantly, it was one of the few newspapers to report fully on the atrocities of the Holocaust caused during World War II. This was the primary goal of the publishers who strove to make the Aufbau one of the leading anti-Nazi publications of what they considered the German press in exile. Aufbau means reconstruction. It's a German word. It means reconstruction, rebuilding, building up. And that's exactly what the newspaper did for the German Jewish population that it served. It connected them, it brought them information, provided intellectual stimulation, and all of this in their old familiar language. While the refugees' first major goal was to master their new language well enough to comprehend the news, the headlines, and the editorials in the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, the Journal American, the Post, the Daily News, it was a time of many newspapers in New York, um, the Aufbau in particular and, and um, uniquely spoke to them in words and tones that they immediately understood. Most important perhaps was a publication the Aufbau put together in 1941 called the Aufbau Almanac. This was nothing short of a fully comprehensive guide to living in the US. It explained American politics, the education system, basic law, the postal system, sports, and many other important topics that the newcomers needed to grasp to succeed in America. It was a complete handbook for the German speaking Jews, an introduction to life in America. After the war, the Aufbau helped families find one another by publishing survivors' names, photos, and contact information. It became even more important than ever. From 1944 to 1946, the paper gathered information from Jewish relief agencies and officials in DP camps, and they printed lists of Holocaust survivors still in Europe, as well as lists of victims. Official databases aided hopeful relatives in their search for family members and um, whose whereabouts and status were unknown. Another critical factor in helping the Jews become Americanized fit into society and find their place in the new world was synagogue affiliation. In an effort to understand the complex array of systems that worked in their new home country, the German Jews depended heavily on the activities, some of the activities that had sustained them in their old lives, many of them based on their Jewish beliefs and culture. Attendance at temple played a major role in communal life and provided an anchor for those at sea in the new country. And it forced, uh, it helped them, those who were forced to cope with the new cultural world that they found themselves in. <clears throat> the German speaking immigrants founded at least a dozen congregations in Washington Heights and took over a few native country con congregations as well. The choices of synagogues included all three branches of Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative and Reform, and services tended to reflect the nature of the, that the, um, of the uh, synagogue culture that the immigrants brought with them. These were set patterns of synagogue seating, proper dress, 
uh, respect for those in charge and a, a certain level of formality. There were several liberal synagogues such as Beth Hillel and these were founded by the refugees who came to Washington Heights. Some of the immigrants joined American congregations and then changed them to suit their needs. One of these was the Reform Hebrew Tabernacle. Um, this was originally an American congregation, but a large number of German speaking Jews joined it, made it German and moved it uptown ultimately. Some of the immigrants of course joined no synagogue at all. Uh, because of the economic difficulties of those first years of immigration, some people who had attended synagogue regularly in Europe found they had to work on Saturdays. This was especially true for the many German Jews who worked in the watch and jewelry business. Other people attempted to save money by changing their level of observance and buying non-kosher food, for example, which was less costly. Some people, some of the refugees re re returned to stricter practice after the war when increasing prosperity made it easier to take time off to observe the Sabbath and the holidays. Over half of the Jews in Washington Heights in the 40s, 50s, and 60s were affiliated members with a synagogue, and many more beyond that sent their children to Hebrew school without officially joining themselves, often in yet another attempt to join um, to save money, uh, but also sometimes in with some discomfort at displaying one's Judaism. So Sometimes there was an unease at such a uh, public declaration of religion after having been targeted for destruction because of being Jewish. So residents who chose to affiliate had many options, including Temple of the Covenant, the Fort Ryan Jewish Center, Sharei HaTikva, Temple Beth Am, Kol Adat Jasharun, the Washington Heights Congregation, and a host of others. Despite the importance of temple events and activities, however, most socializing among the German Jews in Washington Heights took place outside of the synagogue. On weekends, the new immigrants brought their children to the park, gathered with friends and filled the flower lined walkways and the benches, quietly discussing old times in Europe. For example, anyone who grew up in Washington Heights or visited friends or relatives there will remember the major green space of the neighborhood, Fort Ryan Park. Fort Tryon Park delighted children and provided their parents with walking paths and recreation opportunities where they could socialize and places to simply be out in nature. Though densely populated, Washington Heights had over 500 acres of parkland representing a third of the neighborhood's total area an unusually high percentage, particularly for New York City. Fort Tryon Park in particular had spectacular vistas that were so like the Rhine River in Germany, people said, that it was said to be one of the main reasons that the German Jews chose to settle in Washington Heights. Situated between Broadway and the Hudson River on a ridge just above 192nd Street and Cabrini Boulevard, the park had carefully landscaped gardens, woodlands and meadows, a cafe, playgrounds, a paved pedestrian path, and a formal promenade. Kids climbed on so-called monkey bars and swung on suspended metal swings while parents, all dressed up for a walk in the park, met and mingled and traded stories and worries. Within the park stood the world famous Cloisters Museum, home to one of the largest and most extensive collections in the world of medieval European art and artifacts. Of course, it is still there today, open for visits. Um, they, this uh, museum includes the famous unicorn tapestries, which are probably the best known part of the uh, museum. And classroom visits from the local public schools often took place there, providing lessons in art and history and offering a level of education that the German Jews particularly appreciated. Two other parks, two other local parks offered pleasure, exercise and community gathering space to the residents of Washington Heights, bringing pleasure and exercise to the children of the neighborhood. One was Bennett Park on Pinehurst Avenue between 183rd and 186th Streets, the natu highest natural elevation in Manhattan. And the other was J. Hood Wright Park on Fort Washington Avenue and Haven Avenue uh, between 173rd and 176th Street. Now, while moms and dads chatted with friends and neighbors, kids played slug using a pink, punching a pink Spaldine ball back and forth against concrete walls 
or gathered to kneel on the paved playgrounds, flicking bottle caps with their fingers. Often the bottle caps would be weighted with wax to make them um, move more specifically. And they flick these bottle caps into boxes drawn with chalk on the sidewalk um, in, in a game of skill called Scully, a game that was played all over the city. Now, just outside the park, children played stickball on the street, calling out to each other in a well-organized medley of yelps to warn of approaching cars. But there was more than greenery, places to sit in the sun and the sidewalks to stroll on before heading to friends' houses or local condita rise for coffee and cake, cafe and kuchen, just about every Sunday afternoon. There was entertainment for one thing, three large movie houses. The Grand RKO Coliseum Theater was the largest, most well-known movie theater to offer Washington Heights residents a respite from work and worry, particularly on a Saturday night. It was immense. It drew um, uh, people from all over the city and even New Jersey and the suburbs. It was built as a cultural and performing arts center, and it was located on Broadway between 181st and 182nd streets, and it filled a full block. Many a teenager's first kiss took place in the darkened, uh, roomy RKO balcony during a dramatic new movie. The massive entertainment palace was decorated with marble interiors, terracotta floors, specially designed ironworks, mirrors, and an enormous pipe organ, plus ornamental plastering. It had 3,500 seats. Now the Heights Theater, down the block, a small art cinema just south of 181st Street on Wadsworth Avenue, one block from Broadway, entertained neighborhood residents plus crowds of people who came from other parts of the city to view its often um, offbeat, arty, sometimes even foreign language, culturally oriented films. A few blocks further south was the Lowe's 175th Street Theater on Broadway offering first run movies and a huge plush auditorium with 3,350 seats, a little bit smaller than the RKO Coliseum. Built in 1930 with a lavishly eclectic interior, it included filigreed walls and ceilings and served as a posh gathering place and cultural art center for the community. Downtown, on the further downtown, not really downtown, on the corner of 165th Street and Broadway was the Audubon Ballroom. This was originally a movie theater, but then became a meeting space for unions and other organizations and the site of many weddings and bar mitzvahs through the 30s, 40s, and 50s. The building acquired its greatest historical significance in 1965 when Malcolm X was assassinated there during a rally of the Organization of Afro-American Unity. Many notable celebrities lived in Washington Heights over the years including Harry Belafonte, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Lou Gehrig, Maria Callas, Frankie Lyman, Freddie Prince, former mayor, David Dinkins, Henry Kissinger, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, and even Fonzie, now that is Henry Winkler, for those of you who remember him from the beloved TV show, Happy Days. The German Jews, always concerned about their health, appreciated the fact that skilled physicians were available to them locally, at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, one of the finest hospitals in the US then and now. It was located and is still, even though it's expanded between 165th and 168th Street, west of Broadway. Today it is known as uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Now shopping in the famous stores in Washington Heights kept residents happily fed and clothed and brought not only sustenance, but a clear sense of culture that they were making their own. The major shopping street was 181st Street, centrally located and running from river to river across Broadway. It was the east-west major street, one of them, and Broadway the major north-south street. 181st Street was lined with so many stores, it was possible to shop for just about anything. Furs, sausages, toys, winter coats, hats, even furniture from the famous Goldsmith and Sons. The two largest stores were W.T. Grant, a giant of mass merchandising, and Wertheimer's department store, where you could just, you could buy clothes, shoes, furs, fabrics for sewing, kitchen appliances, lamps, nylon stockings, and just about everything in between. 
Many people who grew up there who are watching may remember shopping for all styles of kids shoes at Joseph's Shoe Store on 181st Street. At that time and in that place, a sales clerk used a machine called a fluoroscope to x-ray your feet as you tried on each pair of shoes to check the fit by seeing if your toes were situated well in the shoes. This is a machine that's deemed a little dangerous today, but nevertheless, it was something that Joseph's used and the mothers were very happy about it. And then there was Buster Brown Shoes with its famous promise just a few blocks downtown. The latest styles in women's footwear could be found at National Shoes. Numerous food stores catered to German Jewish tastes, including Kostreich's and the popular and well-loved Block and Falk. Sid's Candy Store sold penny candy and comics, and there were soda fountains there that made those delicious foamy egg creams. Bakeries for homemade breads, pastries, Apfelstrudel, and Linzer tarts were very popular, including Grunebaum's, Lombardi's, G&G Bakery, and Gideon's. Washington Heights was a neighborhood where people were on a first name basis and the shopkeepers were no exception. On just one block on 181st Street from between Fort Washington Avenue and Cabrini Boulevard, there was Irving the Butcher, Max and Bernie's Grocery Store, Carl Zimmer's Vegetable Market. With no large supermarket within walking distance, people shopped for fresh food every day and the vendors acted like neighbors and friends and actually became neighbors and friends. In between visiting shopping venues for a treat on the weekends, Washington Heights residents could enjoy a leisurely lunch at the Goodwill restaurant. This was the main and one of the very few Asian restaurants in the neighborhood at the time. And they could sample the then exotic chicken chow mein and chop suey and wonder how anyone managed to pick up rice with those skinny wooden sticks. Pizza by the Slice was still new to Washington Heights during the year that German Jewish immigrants dominated the neighborhood. And while many adults looked at it with some suspicion, most teenagers couldn't get enough. Sometimes on the trip home from school, they would have to make the difficult decision between eating a folded slice while walking down the street or shopping at Dave's Deli for a sour pickle. Some of you may remember that there was a branch of the famous Horn and Hardot automat chain on 181st Street where you could dine on a dime as the jingle went. The food was inexpensive and fast, and you picked out your meal from sleek steel and glass vending machine grids that displayed everything, sandwiches, main dishes, desserts, everything you could imagine. And each was in its own small steel enclosure. So you put a coin in the slot, opened the door and removed your food, at which point a behind the machine human would slippily quickly slip in another sandwich or piece of pie or salad or coffee cake into the vacated chamber. Ads for the automat said it was like a magic show with food. For many years, a local trolley line ran on embedded tracks up and down Broadway, and the streetcars whisked passengers to school, work, and shopping in the neighborhood. Apparently, from history, more passengers than the subways, buses, and elevated lines combined. The famous Brooklyn Dodgers, organized as an American League team in the years before the German Jews came to Washington Heights, originally got their name, the Trolley Dodgers. This was because of the many streetcar lines um, that ran around the park and the tracks on both sides that they were very successful at dashing past um, without ever getting hit by any of the trolleys going by. So the trolley cars disappeared in the early 50s when General Motors, as the story goes, Doug paid to dig up the tracks in order to, um, in a move to encourage people to buy more cars. And of course, the Dodgers absconded to Los Angeles in 1957 in any case. Although old fashioned and insular in a number of ways, the Washington Heights immigrant community was not isolated. Most inhabitants worked outside the neighborhood and often shopped downtown. For the, they looked for the latest fashions because this was important to them. They went to glamorous stores like B. Altman, Best & Company, Bon Mateller, and Depina, iconic department stores that sadly no longer exist today. They visited relatives and friends and attended cultural events in other parts of the city as well. The Metropolitan Opera in Midtown was a particular draw, as were movies at Radio City, which was then the largest and most modern air-conditioned movie theater in town, one that offered velvet seats, cool air in summer, and a measure of comfort along with a double feature in Midtown. 
for summer vacations, most of the newcomers to the US went to the Catskills. For decades after coming to America, few of the German Jews went back to Europe, except once in a while to visit relatives' graves. The idea of taking a trip to Europe was heavily loaded with the kind of emotion that most of the refugees were still struggling to contain. As their affluence increased, however, they went to Florida for sunny winter vacations instead. While leisure activities were relatively easy to plan when there was time and money to do so, establishing a stable work life for the new residents of Washington Heights was fraught with problems. Many of the people who had immigrated to, the, to Washington Heights had been professionals in Germany, but had to start all over again, trying to build a new career. For example, those who had been physicians in Germany had to train once again in New York for years, becoming licensed only after a great deal of study, many years of study, work, and service. This option of transferring one's profession was even more difficult for those who had been lawyers in the old country, as it was extremely hard, as you can imagine, to master the English language well enough to practice law in the US, and also to learn an entirely different legal system as well. To help solve the work problems, HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, trained thousands of German Jewish immigrants in useful fields, creating competent workers in and finding jobs for watchmakers and jewelers, furriers and food workers, and workers on all levels of the garment industry. HIAS, a Jewish American nonprofit created to provide humanitarian aid and assistance to Jewish refugees who came to the US still today is functioning and helps refugees of all ethnicities and religions who come to the US from all over the world today, seeking a better life. Another organization called Self Help was very significant in aiding the German Jewish refugees and continues their support today, particularly of Holocaust survivors. While finding work in the years when German Jewish immigrants were flooding Washington Heights, the years at the height of the depression was always difficult Getting to work was not. This was because of the highly developed New York City subway system, which I've mentioned before, and is just so important in terms of understanding Washington Heights and all of New York City. And this system efficiently linked Washington Heights to the midtown and downtown business areas of Manhattan. The Interboro Rapid Transit Company, then known as the IRT, was the first subway line to be built in New York City with stations in Washington Heights at 157th, 168th Street, 181st and 191st and Dykeman Street. It is now part of the Broadway 7th Avenue line. The famous A train of song whisked resident, residents downtown on the IND 8th Avenue line with stops at 168th, 175th, 181st, 190th, um, all along Fort Washington Avenue. Now for those with big dreams, the goal of owning a car represented a major step up the ladder of prosperity. And many residents set it as a goal once their basic needs were taken care of, even though parking in Washington Heights was always a challenge. But the increased mobility a car offered was a big draw. Right at the base of one of the neighborhood's most central streets, 179th Street, stood the George Washington Bridge, the world's busiest motor vehicle bridge and one of the world's most beautiful, connecting residents to New Jersey, where many members of the Washington Heights community finally were um, able to find work and um, provided a way for them to commute to work easily. To prepare for a profitable and satisfying career, education, always important to Jews everywhere, was especially critical in the minds of the German and Austrian refugees. And um, also, uh, the other European Jews who came later. So systems were set up to satisfy those who came first and those who came later. High levels of learning flourished in Washington Heights public schools with their citywide reputation for excellence. This highly regarded educational opportunity, um, these opportunities that kept being developed were a big incentive for the immigrants to settle in Washington Heights and remain there throughout their children's school years. New York City public schools were typically identified by number, often, usually, correlating to the streets on which they were located. For example, Washington Heights children attended elementary school PS, that's public school, 187, 173, 
152 on Nagel Avenue, 189, and then went on to regional junior high schools PS, at PS52 on Academy Street, PS115 on West 177th Street, and PS143 on 182nd Street, not to forget 164 on Edgecombe Avenue. And some of these may be familiar to some of you who are uh, listening to this program today. The regional uh, high school, George Washington, located in a grand building on Audubon Avenue and 193rd Street, was prestigious for many decades after its 1925 founding and is still very well thought of today and graduated such luminaries as Alan Greenspan and Henry Kissinger and also Maury Jarvik. So he is the inventor of the nicotine patch. And Washington Heights even had a fully accredited uh, university in the neighborhood, the prestigious um, Yeshiva University with its main campus on 184th Street east of Broadway. Now, while the excellent school system in Washington Heights helped the neighborhood's children prepare for a future, and shops and restaurants gave the neighborhood its unique set of flavors, the success of the search for permanence and acceptance for the German Jews who had lost their way of life by fleeing from Hitler depended a great deal on the peace and comfort they could create in their own home. For many, two special housing complexes dominated the landscape one to live in, the other to yearn for. The first was called Castle Village on Cabrini Boulevard. Five tall, beautiful 12-story buildings with spacious rental apartments that had sunken living rooms and river views and a long stretch of cultivated gardens on a high bluff along Riverside Drive, above Riverside Drive. The other was Hudson View Gardens on Pinehurst Avenue and Cabrini Boulevard, one of the oldest housing cooperatives in the US. But like many other co-ops in the city in the 40s and 50s, restricted, meaning that no Jews were permitted to live there. A stinging slap in the face to the German and Austrian Jews who settled in Washington Heights and those who came later. It would be decades before Jews would be permitted to live there, but the time did come in the 60s when the restrictions were removed. Although progress like this never stopped being made in the neighborhood, the fact is that the life and culture the German, of the German Jews of Washington Heights was essentially restricted to a single generation. This was caused in part by the successful Americanization and assimilation of the immigrants' children, most of whom were able to go on to higher education, but also by the fact that most of the children had the affluence derived from their parents' success to move away. They were attracted by other rich, vibrant parts of the city and by the lure of the suburbs. The signs were slowly appearing in the late 50s and early 60s that Washington Heights would not forever continue to be a neighborhood of European Americans. By the 1960s, the, demogra the demographic shifts had entered full force with the arrival of waves of immigrants from Puerto Rico and the neighborhood's Latino population saw great increases. Puerto Ricans were the dominant Latino group in the Heights until 1965, when Cubans overtook them in number. By the 1970s, evidence of the exodus of the broader Jewish community was present in the changing landscape, where kosher butchers and Jewish bakeries were gradually replaced by new shops with signs in Spanish. If you stood on the street corner waiting for the bus, you would likely hear several different dialects of Spanish, but no German. By the 1980s, the vast majority of the neighborhood's inhabitants were immigrants from the Dominican Republic. So many settled there that politicians from the Dominican Republic were known to campaign in Washington Heights for votes back home. The popular film In the Heights is a story about Dominicans in Washington Heights with not a mention of the legacy of the German Jews. The good schools, convenient transportation systems, beautiful parks and good housing stock once again attracted another new population bent on success, just as, as it had done with the German Jews in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Urban historians say that over the years, Washington Heights has offered support to a mosaic of ethnic groups that went there to make a new life. The Eastern European Jews in flight from pogroms, German and Austrian Jewish refugees from Nazism, the Irish and the Greeks, Latinos fleeing economic hardship, the Soviet Jews escaping anti-Semitism, the Holocaust survivors who came from all across Europe in the aftermath of the war. 
For all their differences though, the groups had one thing in common, individual and collective memories of leaving home and family and settling in a new place. Such experiences were traumatic, deeply traumatic, but difficult though they were, they tended to breed resilience. They also developed character, community, a sense of shared purpose and dreams of a better life. One in which every sunrise brought new opportunity. This is the lasting legacy of the immigrants who came to Washington Heights in search of safety, hope and healing, especially the European Jews, a people of strength. So now I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Linda, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and uh, really you've opened up a whole host of questions and comments have been pouring in from people who are talking about how your presentation reminded them of their experiences when they lived in Washington Heights or their experiences uh, visiting Washington Heights. So uh, there's too many of those comments for me to share with you, but I know I, I will share with them with you after the program and so many very positive remarks coming in. But I wanted to, to draw some questions that have come in in uh, our last few minutes. And so one of them is about when was the, the peak of the German Jewish community in Washington Heights and what kind of, uh, what percentage at that peak did German Jews make up and what's the situation now? I know you talked about the fact that other immigrants come in. Are there Jews who have left? I mean, I know there are some Jews who continue to live there. Is there some German Jewish presence still? Hmm, that's a lot of questions all at once. So um, the peak um, of the German Jewish um, influence in Washington Heights was between the late 30s and the early 50s. And um, they, at the time, the Jews, the German Jews and the European, other European Jews who came um, after the war uh, made up a little bit over 50% of the community, um, which um, you think, well, maybe it would be 75 or 80 or 90, but 50% is enormous. It meant that every other person you saw on the street was a European Jew. And so in terms of today, um, Washington Heights um, still has a Jewish presence, but it's small. There are um, many people who have rediscovered Upper Manhattan, and just as people rediscovered Brooklyn and totally changed it in the last um, decade. And so that's, that's pretty much the story there now. There are some Holocaust survivors who stayed, but not very many. Um, but fortunately, um, there is still a, a small German Jewish presence and um, the European Jews may, the descendants of the Jews, the two Gs and the three Gs may continue to move back uptown because there's good transportation. Anyone who listens to NPR knows that Brian Lehrer lives in Inwood. So it's still, a, it's still very much a thriving community. Uh, several people have asked this, but do you, it's, I believe you have a personal connection to this neighborhood. Do you wanna share something about that? And somebody asked if, what was the impact for you in this neighborhood, if this is a place where you have a personal connection? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I grew up in Washington Heights. Uh, my parents came from Vienna at the end of 1938 and moved to Washington Heights because they had relatives there. And um, that's where we lived. Um, I lived there for um, 25 years before I moved downtown to uh, West 94th Street on my own. Um, it was a community that was very, um, uh, complete, I should say. There was not as much interest in the outside world as one might think. Um, it was very supportive, it was very warm, and um, it was an excellent experience. Of course, one looks back as being a teenager and says, oh no, I hated it, it was horrible. But looking back on it as an adult and having raised my children, I see how important the neighborhood is and that there are there's a place to belong and people that you relate to, um, a place where you feel that you matter. You know, some, some people made comments uh, while you were speaking about how the description you gave of Washington Heights reminded them of the neighborhoods they grew up in in Brooklyn or mm -hmm. in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering to what degree do you think the this what was unique about Washington Heights? Was it the same or similar as what was going on in these other neighborhoods uh, of in Brooklyn or in the Bronx? Mm -hmm. It was definitely similar, very similar, because at the time, it was such a difficult time for Jews, whether they were born here or emigrated. 
um, there was anti-Semitism and um, the Holocaust and all of World War II was um, just a devastating experience psychologically and many other ways too, but psychologically in particular. And people at that time in these communities clung together and they supported each other. And there was a sense of um, being part of something that was a little bit bigger than them, but not immensely bigger. They were not citizens of the world at the time, as many of people today like to think of themselves. So there were definite similarities. The, the idea is that if you live among people who are like you and speak your language and eat the same foods and have the same manners, um, you will feel a sense of connection. So fortunately for many people, there were these pockets throughout the city. And, and am I right that one of the distinguishing characteristics of, of Washington Heights was this particular German language so that um, maybe other Europeans, other European Jews, uh, might have been settling in other neighborhoods in Brooklyn or, or the Bronx, but there really was a notable density of German speakers in Washington right. Heights that might have made that a slightly different experience, in the, especially in the 40s and 50s, than some other neighborhoods. Is that right? Yes, definitely, because the German Jews were the first ones who were basically kicked out of Europe and um, knew they had to leave. And if they were able to leave, they got out and they went where there were other people like them. So Washington Heights became this beacon. And that's one of the things that distinguished it and brought this um, a large percentage of this um, immigrant population to that area. Um, I know you touched on some of this, but there were a bunch of questions also that came in about the relationship between uh, the German Jews who are coming to Washington Heights in the uh, in the, in this period in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and and the earlier Jews who had come and settled in the Lower East Side or other parts, were there tensions between these communities? Were there bridges that were built between these communities? Were they isolated? What what were the kind of social and and cultural connections? There were a lot of connections, and one of the major ones was Yiddish. Even though the German and Austrian Jews, um, I guess, officially didn't speak Yiddish, they all spoke Yiddish. So they might say, oh, I don't know any Yiddish at all. And I've told this story before, but I once said to my mother, like, why do I understand Yiddish when you don't know any Yiddish? And she said, give me an example. And I gave her an example. And she said, oh, that's not Yiddish. That's Viennese dialect. OK, so this united Jews. We know this about language and about culture. And um, also, you know, the European Jews who came from other parts of Europe, many of them knew German because you know, Europe is small and has all these languages and people are always traveling. So um, Europeans know a lot of language and uh, languages. And then there was the, um, you know, the unification of, of Yiddish. And a lot of the uh, Lower East Side people who became more prosperous moved up to Washington Heights, just like a lot of the people from Washington Heights who became more prosperous moved to Queens or to the suburbs or to the Upper West Side. Um, another thing that I know you touched on, but but inspired some questions, was about that relationship between these refugees and Germany and German culture, mm -hmm. uh, and about there were some some people asked questions about did German Jews end up fighting in the United States military during World War II? Did some of this population go back to fight against Hitler? And, and others asked about just culturally, like. Was there, and I know you touched on, was there a tension between being German and being Jewish in New York? Uh, well, um, again, big question. So yes, many of the, um, the young men who came over um, after being thrown out of Germany and Austria were then later drafted. Um, some, a fair portion were drafted, but excused at their physical for having psychological problems. And many never quite understood did they really have psychological problems or did they just have a kind doctor who said, you've been through enough, you don't have to go back. But the ones who did uh, were extremely useful because they spoke German and they could understand um, the enemy and they could spy and they, they were very useful. So yes, they, they, they definitely did um, contribute to the war effort. And then what was the other part of the question? Um, what, in what ways was there tension with being German and Jewish? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, a lot. But of course, being in Germany and Austria, there was tension between being German and being Jewish. So that was brought here. And I think a lot of the um, European Jews wanted to hide their Jewishness. Um, 
many raise children who don't identify as Jews, or they identify only culturally, but don't do anything in terms of religion. They didn't have their children um, learn a great deal of Jewish history and culture. Um, so th there were definitely issues. But on the other hand, a very large proportion of the European Jews, when they, the German Jews in particular, when they um, made enough money, bought uh, BMWs and Mercedeses. So how do you describe the tension between being German and being Jewish, right? It's very layered. And there were also non-Jewish Germans. Mm -hmm. It was the, I know there was the York, the Yorkville neighborhood that was uh, mm -hmm. a large German community in the, in the late 19th century and early, early 1900s. And there was similarly a distancing between American non-German Jews, mm -hmm. sorry, non-Jewish Germans, Yes. with Germany as well, right? There was a distancing from German culture, not only a fear of being Jewish for the Jews, but also a disla or a kind of distancing of German culture for a lot of Germans. Is that right? Yes, yes definitely. Yeah. I mean, that neighborhood in, in Yorkville in the Upper East Side, um, it's still there. They still have, you know, I was there recently, not specifically to go there, but in that neighborhood, there's still um, German restaurants with uh, deer heads on the wall. And you know, a, an emphasis on hunting, and you know, a lot of German Gentile culture. Um, a bunch of people are responding about the Ritchie boys, and wondering if you know if the if there were members from this community who ended up serving with, uh, becoming the Ritchie boys, joining uh, Camp Ritchie and learning how to use their German skills against the Nazis, uh, mm -hmm. and and if this was a, a kind of uh, a source for some of those Ritchie boys. Hmm, I wish I had an answer to that, but I don't. I, it's not something that I'd ever heard of. The people that um, I knew there and the people that I came across through my research um, were too involved in their own survival and had too much trouble adapting and learning to be able to go on and do something huge and brave like that. I'm sure there were, but it's not anything that I've come across. But I will look at it. It's a very interesting idea. Um, we have to finish soon, but I wanted to pose a couple more of the questions that have come in and many more we won't get to, but I, I'll share them with you, Linda, and perhaps you'll be able to respond offline. Sure. But uh, the difference between Washington Heights and Inwood, these are neighborhoods that are right next to each other. Were they different? How were they different? Uh, how would you distinguish them? Mm -hmm. They were both beautiful communities. They both had the Hudson River and the parks. Um, the differences were there were fewer German Jews in Inwood than in Washington Heights. And there was a, a larger Irish population. If you walk down the street in Inwood, you would see kosher butchers, you would see temples, you would see Nash, the Kundi Rai that I mentioned, but you would see a lot of bars. And there were almost no bars in Washington Heights. It just reflected a different population. But Inwood was also a beautiful place, just more mixed. Uh, one last question I'll pose to you that's come in. Um, somebody write, mentions that the German Jews in the 1930s who settled in Chicago tend to clash uh, with the earlier Jewish community because of what he describes as a snobbery, uh, a I think a class and economic differences with compared to the earlier some of the earlier Jewish immigrants. Was that something that was taking place in New York as well? I, it was taking place in New York. I think those kind of social stratifications take place everywhere in the world, unfortunately. It was not something that um, had any impact on Washington Heights that I have found because um, the people who were snobbish and well, more well off and came earlier and were more Americanized and so on, they didn't live in Washington Heights. They lived in better neighborhoods. And so it was an intellectual issue, I'm sure with some people, but it was not part of the community in Washington Heights that I found in my research. Well, I'm afraid we are not going to get to the other questions. Linda, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. And I look forward to hearing more of your presentations in the future. And for everybody out there, thank you again for joining us today. And I hope to see you at some of our other programs very soon. You can find a full list on our website at www.hmtcli.org and then click on the events tab. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.